In this video, I'm going to tell you the 6 mistakes you need to avoid when buying a TV in 2020. Hello everyone, my name is Vincent Thieu. I am an ex-professional calibrator. And as a two-man team, we have reviewed some of the most high-end TVs on the market, including the Panasonic HZ2000 OLED, the top-end Samsung Q950TS QLED TV, the Sony ZH8 or ZH8K TV, and we've done more such comparisons than any other YouTube channel in existence, including the world's first comparison of the two 8K TV sets from Sony and Samsung. So, what I'm going to do in this video is to base it upon our experience and what we have gleaned from all these TV reviews and comparisons and tell you the 6 mistakes that you generally need to avoid when buying a TV in 2020. Mistake number 1 is to go for a size that's too small. Now, on this channel, I don't really talk about size enough. Just look at the size of this thing. Now, I won't make any jokes about size because I'm too big for that. I'm just really <laughs> pissing myself here because I'm standing beside the absolutely massive 98-inch 8K QLED television from the South Korean brand. So it's best not to go larger than 150 inches. It's one of those cases where too big a size can become uncomfortable. Is it actually worth paying so much more for 13 inches? And my answer is, you know, I would give anything to get an extra 13 inches. But considering your room setup and also your budget, you probably should also consider whether you can go the next size up. So let's say if you were eyeing a 55 inch OLED, think whether you can actually go one step up to 65 inches. And if you were eyeing a 65 inch OLED, maybe go one step up to the 77 inch version if your space and budget allows. No video file has gone to heaven complaining that their TV is too big. Basically, what it is is that you know with modern televisions, the bezels are becoming thinner and thinner, so they are actually easier to actually fit into a modern living room. And also, with native 4K content and with the upscaling quality on these modern televisions, you can actually sit fairly close to the TV and not see many of the artifacts that has plagued previous TVs from let's say 10 years ago and you will get more immersion from just sitting closer to the TV and getting a larger TV size and I've known a few people who sit as close as 6 feet away from a 77 inch screen. So the first thing is to obviously set your budget and your room layout but consider whether by spending just a bit more you can go the next step up in terms of the size. So for OLED going for 55 to 65 or from 65 to 77 and for LCD maybe consider going from let's say 75 to even an 85 inch if your budget and also your room setup allows. Like I said, no video file has ever gone to heaven complaining that their TV is too big. The increase in size is going to just immerse you into the picture without much downside in terms of the artifacts at all. This video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. With more and more people staying home these days, Netflix is continuing to cap the bitrate of certain shows, especially in Europe, which will cause the picture to look softer with more compression artifacts such as macro blocking, pixelation and noise in dark scenes. What if there's a way to access Netflix servers in another country where streaming bitrate is not capped? This is where a VPN comes in. Surfshark allows you to stream content from another country without needing you to be physically there, so you can watch Netflix in higher bitrates and better picture quality. You can also get more content that's not available in your region, perhaps the US Netflix library which contains more movie titles. For less than the price of a Big Mac per month, you can use Surfshark on as many devices as you want in your household, all at the same time. There's 24-7 live customer support, a 30-day money-back guarantee, and even instructions on how to set up the VPN on your LG or Samsung smart TV. And for a limited time only, if you use promo code HDTVTEST, you'll get 83% off and 3 extra months free. So sign up today and give Surfshark a try. I'll put the link in the YouTube description below. Thanks again for your support.
The mistake number two is to assume that 8K is important. Genuinely, we are in 2020 and 8K is a non-entity at all, realistically speaking, because there are no native 8K content on the market at the moment that is available to consumers. Yes, there are some videos on YouTube, but they are so heavily compressed that you can barely tell the difference between an 8K YouTube video from a 4K YouTube video from your normal viewing distance anyway because of just how our eyes perceive this increase, this minute increase in resolution. And obviously, there are some phones out there that can shoot 8K video. And maybe you are thinking about watching some self-generated content in 8K. Well, self-generated content is generally the principle behind every amateur sex tape, but these are generally not of high quality. These are not, say, cinematic, you know, there's no 8K Blu-ray on the horizon. 8K broadcast is going to take ages to come around to Europe and the USA when 4K is not even widespread yet. So the content isn't there. And also from my comparison between 8K TVs and 4K TVs, 8K TVs most of the time actually has lower picture quality than 4K TVs because with an 8K TV, you need to pack more pixels into the panel and therefore with an increase in pixel density, you get a reduction in light transmittance and this reduction in light transmittance actually degrades the picture quality. You don't get as high a peak brightness. The local dimming algorithm needs to work harder to try and compensate and to generate deep blacks. So for all intents and purposes, a 4K TV is enough for 2020 and even maybe down to 2022, 2023. So if you're thinking about future proofing, now is not the time to buy an 8K TV. You're just spending more money for a benefit that is barely going to be even realized and you may even suffer from a lower picture quality. Mistake number three is to assume that your next TV is going to need HDMI 2.1. And I see this time and again in all my TV reviews. So let's say a TV doesn't actually have an HDMI 2.1 chipset, then it will automatically be ignored or removed from their shortlist of certain TV buyers. I think that is a grave mistake because HDMI 2.1, realistically speaking, is only really important to gamers. And even within the subset of gamers, I think it is genuinely only important to PC gamers, high-end PC gamers, using the NVIDIA RTX 30 series cards. I'll tell you why it is. When the Xbox Series X and the PS5 next-gen consoles come out, obviously they will say that they will support 4K 120Hz and things like that. But genuinely, I think you know there are going to be very, very few titles AAA titles that will support such high resolution at such high frame rate. Most of it will be running at a bread and butter of 4K at 60Hz, which can be supported on existing HDMI 2.0b televisions. And I think by shoehorning yourself into needing an HDMI 2.1 set, you are ignoring many other excellent televisions on the market. If you don't play games, I don't think HDMI 2.1 is important at all. Let's say eARC, you know, it can be supported on HDMI 2.0b chipsets. There are many TVs on the market that already has eARC implemented on HDMI 2.0b chipsets. And VRR is another important feature of HDMI 2.1, but that is only important for gamers anyway. So if you don't play games, I'm telling you that there are many excellent TVs out there, which may be cheaper as well than HDMI 2.1 TVs that would be more suitable for your needs. So don't just be blinded by HDMI 2.1 and be attracted to it as if it is necessary for all purposes, for all use cases. Consider your own use case. If you don't play games, you don't really need an HDMI 2.1 television. Let's say on the Sony side, the only HDMI 2.1 television in terms of full bandwidth support and all the other variable refresh rate feature is the Sony XH90 or X900H in the USA. But the picture quality is lower than the XH95 or X950H, which doesn't have HDMI 2.1. Now, if you are not a gamer and you're not likely to play games anytime soon, you should just go for the XH95 because it is 
the one that delivers better picture quality with more local dimming zones, higher peak brightness, better motion, better smooth gradation, and better near black handling. It is just as simple as that. So don't be shoehorned into thinking that you need HDMI 2.1. Mistake number four is to trust the refresh rates that are being put out by manufacturers. Now, different manufacturers usually use their own proprietary technology or maybe just guesswork to come up with a random number to describe the motion rate. Let's say through motion 240, let's say motion flow XR 360, whatever. What you need to know is that there are basically only two major refresh rates on the market for all consumer televisions, 60 hertz, and 120 hertz and if your budget allows you should always try and go for a 120 hertz television especially if you go with a larger screen size which i talked about in the first tip with a lower refresh rate of 60 hertz what you are going to be missing is motion interpolation to improve motion clarity and also when you actually display 24 frames per second film if the TV doesn't actually display at 48 hertz, then it will have to do 32 pull down, which will result in telecynic judder. So those are the two key advantages of having a native 120 hertz panel. And the majority of the high-end televisions will have 120 hertz. So just be aware. Don't just blindly trust the figures that are being put out by manufacturers. Know that TVs are divided into 120 hertz and 60 hertz, and for most intents and purposes as a video enthusiast or just someone who desire better picture quality you should strongly consider buying a 120 hertz television especially as the screen size goes larger and the fifth mistake that i see many potential tv buyers make is that they think if you buy an hdr television all hdr content will look good and that is rarely the case for a couple of reasons. Let's talk about the first reason. Not all HDR TVs are made equal. So different TVs, especially at different price points, they have different peak brightness capabilities. And what is integral to a good HDR experience, in my opinion, is a high peak brightness and especially local light control as well. So let's say you have a TV that is 300 nits and H lit. It is not going to be delivering as good an HDR experience as let's say another TV with full or local dimming and a higher peak brightness of 1000 nits. That is just a simple fact. But both of them will be sold as HDR TVs. Both of them will be marketed as HDR capable. But when you buy it home, they will give drastically different HDR experience. So in my personal opinion, from testing all these TVs over the past few years, I firmly believe that you need to spend close to about £1,000 before you can get a decent HDR experience. And by decent HDR experience, the TV needs to have full area local dimming for better light control. And the TV will need to hit at least seven to 800 nits for an LED LCD for reaching that sort of impact. And this is the reason why I think, you know, for most amateur first-time TV buyers or someone who just buys a TV without being an enthusiast, and OLED actually makes more sense because with OLED, every pixel can be controlled individually. So every pixel can be switched on and off independently of each other. And that solves immediately one of the major problems of LED LCDs in that when you display HDR content, the backlight goes up to maximum and blacks get elevated, you get clouding, you get blooming. And this is the reason why local dimming is so important for LED LCDs for a good HDR experience. And OLED solves that by not actually using a backlight. Every pixel can be turned on and off. So with this precise light control, even though OLED is not capable of reaching the very high peak brightness of, say, top-end Fourier local dimming LED LCDs, they actually generate HDR impact because of the ability to control every pixel. Dark areas can remain dark without any blooming or hallowing artifact right next to a really bright speckle of bright highlight detail, let's say the sun, the cloud, the reflections of, let's say, my glasses, things like that. So for most beginners i think you know oled is a good start for a good hdr experience and 
This brings us to my next and last mistake that many potential TV buyers make is to be scared of buying OLED because of permanent burn-in or screen burn. And I think you know there are a few ways for me to actually try and reassure you. First, I have done and also my colleagues at Artings have done a few burn-in tests and we have concluded that for the majority of users where you are actually varying your content, burn-in is not going to be an issue, especially when you take into account the compensation cycles that these OLED TVs will run by themselves when in standby. So if you vary your content, you know, don't watch CNN for eight hours straight every day for four or five years, then you should be fine. And also, I think, you know, Personally, I'm that sort of person who wants the best picture quality, even though there is a slight risk of burning. I'm the sort of person who, if given the opportunity, would rather spend two minutes with Gal Gadot, because that's how long I need, compared with, say, 10 years or a lifetime with a local less, because OLED's picture quality has generally been proven to be as a rule of thumb, better than LED LCDs for a variety of reasons. And to reassure you even further, there are actually some retailers out there on the market who actually offer warranties against permanent screen burn or burn-in. For example, in the United Kingdom where I'm based, John Lewis, a famous retailer, has started offering a warranty that covers permanent screen burn or burn-in according to the policy documents. And it costs just £140 for five years, which is extremely affordable if you ask me. If you are going to splash on an OLED and you want peace of mind for the next five years, then just paying £140 extra and you can use the TV without any worry at all. They will just, you know, replace the TV or return your money if you burnt in your TV accidentally. And also, I believe in the United States, Best Buy also offers a similar type of guarantee or warranty that covers burning. So maybe some of you in the States who have experience with this, uh, you can leave a comment in the YouTube section below. So those are the top six mistakes you need to avoid when buying a TV in 2020, which is based on my experience as an ex-professional calibrator and also someone who has reviewed many of the high-end televisions in 2020. If you would like some more guidance on what TV to buy, I have put a playlist of our technical reviews here if you'd like to watch them and also some of our technical TV comparisons in a playlist here. And I'll see you in the next video. Falling.